Great, so now we move on, as, a, as we said, to a multinational company. So it's Henkel today with us, and specifically Dennis Bankman, which is the, who is the Global Business Development Manager for Circular Economy on the adhesive side, because they have, as you may know, a lot of business branches. And Dennis is going to talk about, uh, with us about the commitment of Henkel in circular economy on the side of the adhesives, and we will also have time for questions after his speech. Thank you, Dennis. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Yes. Hola, bon dia, buenos dias, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and talk to you um, on the behalf of Henkel about circular economy. Uh, what I want to do is uh, show you what we are doing uh, to try to come to a more circular world. And Henkel is doing a lot of things. Um, today, I really want to talk about what we are doing about, as it says here, about packaging. still good? Yeah, okay, good. So you may already know Henkel. If not, uh, here's just a very quick summary. So Henkel is a company that's been around for uh, more than 100 years, and we have three main areas of business. And that is uh, adhesives, which I am part of and I will talk about today. We also have beauty care, and we have laundry and home care businesses. And I think you will see some of the most commonly known brands here in, in Spain. In the areas of beauty care and laundry care, we do use a lot of packaging. We are a pretty large brand or uh, company. And of course, the challenges that everybody has with packaging, we are also working on. I will not talk today as a brand owner, but I will really talk about as a company that makes adhesives and products to create packaging. And ultimately, we are using the same solutions for beauty care and laundry care that we're creating as an adhesives company. So you may or may not know some of our brands and adhesives. Um, this is uh, largely a business-to-business -business operation. We have a few consumer products under the names of Prit, uh, Loctite, uh, Patek, and so on. What are we doing in sustainability? As Henkel, we have for a very, very long time worked intensively on sustainability, uh, and we have a quite broad sustainability strategy. I don't want to spend too much time on this and really focus on the topic of circular economy, but just to show you, these are our main areas that we work on when it comes to sustainability. So we look at social progress, so that's working conditions, living conditions, where we buy our raw materials. We look at the performance of our products, and that has to do with typically doing more with less, so using less adhesive to achieve the same effect, uh, using less... Um, or, or having higher performance, longer lasting products, things that don't break down quickly. We work a lot on health and safety. So this is, for example, in the area of food packaging, very important that we have products that are safe for making food packaging, to maybe put a sticker on a banana or on an apple, uh, but also for medical devices and many other areas. And then we work specifically also constantly at reducing our footprint. And you see here the three main areas of footprint that we look at, that's energy and climate, that is uh, materials and production of waste, and water and wastewater. So these are probably not new. Uh, many companies are working on this, and these are also very well aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals that we've seen in one of the previous presentations. I think what is important to say is that as a adhesives company, we have the unique opportunity that we can influence all these things, not only with our own products, but also for the products, for example, packaging that is made with our adhesives. And that's really wh where I want to focus on for today for the presentation. So within adhesives, just to show that very briefly, we have five different areas that we work in and one is called packaging and consumer goods. And this is really what I will talk about today. So packaging and consumer goods is all the food packaging you find. Uh, it is packaging for pharmaceuticals, so for, uh, so for essentially for drugs, for medical devices. But that's also industrial packaging, uh, when you have a pallet, when you have an industrial product that you need to pack. And consumer goods are things like, for example, clothes, shoes, um, but it's also furniture. Uh, and it's building materials. And all of these are, of course, large volume, um, and many of these are very short-lived. 
So when we talk about consumer products and when we talk about consumers, so what's, what is, I think, clear, absolutely in Europe, but I think in most parts of the world today, what is really on the mind of consumers and what consumers care about uh, is more and more sustainability. So that means that in addition to companies like ours trying to improve sustainability for a long time, now we really have a lot of momentum publicly, and that means also politically, uh, to really make a change. So when we look at what our consumers are thinking about, uh, especially the younger consumers, are very, very mindful today of the effects of how we live and what it means for the environment and ourselves. So sustainability is a, is a big topic. And I think we see that also even today here, that there's a lot of new sustainable brands, and they are growing a lot because people are asking for that. They are asking for a positive change. Also, we've seen already pollution of oceans with plastic is a large, huge topic globally, and um, it is also an important topic. And we are at the point that most of the world's population knows about this, and people are asking for a solution because they don't accept that this should be the case or that it can continue. And what this has really led to is that many, many brand owners, uh, both very large and very small, have made their commitments on what they are going to do about this. In general on sustainability, but also specifically on circular economy, and also specifically on topics that relate to the ocean waste. And maybe some of you have seen the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's work, which is one of the largest uh, non-profit organizations active in that area. Um, they have set up this global commitment that many companies, um, much more than 100 very, very large uh, multinational companies have signed up, as well as smaller and medium-sized ones. So all of these companies, but also governments, uh, municipalities, try to improve and set very specific targets for circular economy that they want to work on, that they want to achieve. And what we try to do as a company that makes adhesives is really to support uh, those who produce uh, consumer goods with making them more circular. I really would not want to leave you without mentioning this, uh, this point as well. So when we think about circular economy, um, there's a lot of topics around that. So we have words like recycling, we have cradle-to-cradle -cradle thinking, we talk about ocean plastic, closing the loop. There's many topics around here. And we feel that circular economy, um, as it is being proposed, is, is a very, very important concept. It can address these topics. It can address topics like ocean pollution. But what's also very important is, it, it, there may be different solutions how we can address things like ocean pollution. But circular economy is the one that also has the most positive contribution to fighting climate change. That's why we feel it is uh, so important. And it is a substantial part of sustainability overall today. So how do we think about circular economy? The word is everywhere. Uh, in, in the media. When you open a newspaper or when you read your news online, you will find the, the, the word mentioned, circular economy. But what does it really mean? Um, it's more than just talking about recycling. So circular economy is a model, it's a concept on how to have a more sustainable economy. And that includes more than just recycling things, and that's very, very important. So it means that we also need to design the things we produce to be ready for recycling. That is one. And the second part is we also need to design the things we produce to include recycled materials. Because imagine a world where everything can be recycled, but nobody buys what comes out of the recycling. Then there will be no recycling, because it's just not sustainable that way. So it's very important to consider this. And what's also important is this paradigm that we need to design all the products we make. From the beginning, we need to consider what happens at the end of their life. So we don't only need to think about how long will they last, how good will they look, how efficiently do I make them, but we also need to look at they will come to the end of their life. They will become trash at some point. What will happen then? How do we design that this is not the end of the life for that product, but that it comes back to a new life? And finally, we as Henkel firmly believe that from all areas, but especially from the adhesive area, uh, we can really make a big difference here and offer new solutions that change the way we produce things and how we can recycle them. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think it, this is a great definition of circular economy because it really, again, mentions the two things we need to deal with here when we want to implement a circular economy. 
So as it says here, a circular economy is a regenerative system in which we minimize the input of resources and importantly, we minimize waste. And we minimize this by, as it says here, slowing, closing and narrowing material and energy loops. So that means circular economy is very much about avoiding waste by reusing everything uh, that reaches its end of life. And you can see that here in the circle. So at some point we start, we take some raw materials, whether they're bio-based or petrochemical-based, we produce items with that for which we need energy. We use and ideally reuse these items as long as we can, but there is an end to this. And at which point we need to find ways to bring it back into production instead of taking new raw materials continuously. And as it says in the second part of the definition, so there are different ways to bring things back um, and to give them a second, a third, and even more lives. And here it says it can be maintenance, repair, reuse, refurbishing, and recycling. And it very much depends on what we're talking about. So when I talk about a car, we are, for us it's normal. When our car has a problem, we repair it and we keep using it. We don't throw it away, right? When an airplane has an issue, it gets fixed and it goes back. Um, maybe what you didn't know, if you have construction machinery, an excavator, or any kind of big uh, machine, often parts are reused to make new machines. So when you buy a machine, you really don't know there's reused parts in that. But when it comes to consumer goods, our packaging, uh, and even um, many things that we use in our daily life, or uh, let's say, for example, medical products, this is not something we typically repair. So for these fast-moving items, recycling uh, is really the key to giving them another life. That's why we put here also into this circle, really recycling. What is important to, to consider is there is energy needed for this, um, and we also need to address how we produce energy to come to sustainable energy. However, that is a topic that is to some extent separate from the question of the circular economy, which is about a lot about keeping the material in the loop. Now, even before we started talking so much about circular economy, we already had this, which is called the waste hierarchy, and maybe many of you have seen that before. So that's really a tool to think about waste. And what's important is this tool is now more valuable uh, than ever, I would say. So um, when we apply this circular economy thinking to waste and how we deal with waste, end-of-life products, we see there's three main phases. We can work on the top, as you can see, on the design of products to prevent the use of certain things. We heard re reduce the amount of plastic that we use, but we should also probably reduce the amount of paper we use and other things that we use. The less we use, the better. That's why it's at the top of the hierarchy. We have the use phase, and I mentioned some things we can repair, or we can design bottles to be filled two, 10 times, 20 times uh, for drinks, let's say. We can have reusable shopping bags and many other things. But there's always a point when a product cannot be used anymore, and this is the end of life. And here, again, recycling takes the top of the options at the end of life. And whenever recycling is not possible, you can still try to recover the energy, which is typically to burn the material and recover some electricity for it, from it. And this is what happens a lot in Europe, but it's not what we should do um, as much as we are doing it now. We should be doing a lot more recycling instead. And what we shouldn't be doing, in any case, is the bottom one, which is disposal. Just putting it into landfill, or worse, letting it escape into the environment, and then we find it in the oceans. And the key point is the lower we are in this pyramid, uh, the less ideal the choice is, as the arrow shows, the more material and energy we lose when we do that. So really, we want to be as high as possible in that hierarchy. And this has been a law in Europe for a long time, but we're really now, I think, coming into motion and really trying to push things further up that hierarchy in practice. So when we look at the top, um, reducing the amount of materials we use uh, or making things reusable, repairable, and actually repairing them, this is something that Henkel has been working on for a long time. So I don't want to talk about this too much today. Um, it's a little bit, let's say, business as usual. And we'll keep doing that. There is a value in this. It doesn't go away. At the same time, when we look at recovering energy from uh, end-of-life products, and when we think about disposal, that's really something where we as Henkel feel we don't have really an impact. Uh, whatever we do with our adhesives, if 
the products are being burned uh, when they're thrown away, we don't make a difference here. Uh, that, that's not what we can influence. But what we can influence uh, and can critically influence in a positive way is recycling. So if your packaging, uh, if your, uh, let's say your shoe, uh, some textiles that you wear, or your furniture makes it to a recycling process, this is really where adhesives can make a big difference, and that's exactly what we're working on. And why is it, or how do we have that influence? So let's look at some typical things that go into recycling today. So here in Spain, it's a different color. Uh, in, in the US, it's blue. So when you have your recyclables bin as a consumer and you put, let's say, a, a can out of aluminum or steel in, a polyester bottle, a cardboard box, some flexible packaging, different things can happen with that. So um, recycling, there's not just one type of recycling, it's different things that happen today. So there's the top, which is called closed loop. This is when you take an item and the recycling works so well that it can become the same item again. And we see that. I mean, the polyester bottles, if they're collected properly, they can be and they are today turned back into bottles. Same is true for the, for the drinks can made out of metal. And actually for many metal packaging, this is the case. For this, we need really excellent purity. We need excellent compatibility. Otherwise, this kind of recycling cannot work. Then secondly, we have a lot of what's called open loop recycling. So open loop recycling means even 100% of, let's say, what we see on the left can be recycled, but it becomes something different in its second life. Yeah? Let's say the bottle becomes this fleece jacket that you wear outdoors. Uh, maybe the, uh, the, the packaging of pasta becomes this shipping box. Uh, and maybe um, some of the items from the, from the can or the flexible packaging go into the vacuum cleaner. So that's still okay, this is recycling, um, but we can't make the same item again. And importantly, even for this, we need compatibility. So what we put into the recycling process needs to be compatible with itself to make any of these things. And then finally, when we have very little compatibility or a lot of contamination, we can make things that you see on the bottom. So you can make some pots for plants or maybe a trash bag but the value of that is low, and these items on the bottom will probably never be recycled again. So that's not what we're trying to, to go for here. So the key is really compatibility, and that means either all the materials in an item need to be compatible, and that includes the adhesive and the ink and everything else, or if, you're, if you have something that has different materials, you need to be able to take them apart before you can do a meaningful recycling. So you really need to separate things again. And let's look at where we are today. I mean, uh, these are some examples. This has no uh, claim to completeness. So um, these are just some highlights, just to give you a flavor of what's going on. So when we look at glass and metal recycling, you see extremely high numbers. And that's great. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, glass and metal is recycled by melting it to very, very high temperature, where everything which isn't metal or glass is more or less burned away. So these are not so problematic formats to recycle. And we see here Europe has a great recycling rate for glass. Um, Brazil, for example, has a fantastic recycling rate for metals, despite the system of waste management being much less formal and much less organized than it is here. Again, tin cans and so on in Europe, extremely high recovery rates, very, very good. When we look at paper, it's a bit more mixed, more than 60%. Um, not bad, certainly can be improved. And we see this is being done, paper is being recycled in many places in the world, say in the US, in Brazil, all over 60%. Not so bad. When we look at polyester bottles, I mentioned it before, there are some countries that have more than 90%. I think uh, in the case of Norway, close to 98% recycling rate, excellent. By the way, I'm not going to talk about this, but it requires you to remove the label from the bottle, which is also related to the adhesive. But what we see on the right is uh, that unfortunately flexible packaging, uh, which is also today very common and, and it's a very efficient way of packaging things. Flexible packaging, the recycling rates are very close to zero or exactly zero. And there are different reasons. In some cases, it's not being collected in certain countries. In some cases, it's not being correctly sorted, but there are places, um, for example, in Germany, where it is collected and it is sorted. So you have a stream, you have a, a large amount of flexible packaging, 
And what happens with it? It's being burnt because it's too difficult to recycle. And the reason is that in many cases, there's different materials in it. There's different types of plastic in it. That makes it difficult. So what we see is there are some challenges for sure. Um, what we see is also with the polyester bottle, some of these challenges already have been solved and we really need to work on those that remain. So how do we do this uh, as an adhesives company? We have three main approaches and I think from what I described so far, you can already have guessed them. So we work on compatibility. So when we have one type of plastic or only paper, we make sure the adhesive is compatible with recycling. That's important. When an item contains different materials. The only way to enable recycling is really to be able to separate the materials. And that's what we're working on, debonding the things we glued together before. And the third thing is we can also come up with totally new designs. So sometimes instead of addressing the issue that's there, you can just go around it and come up with something completely different um, that doesn't have that issue in the first place. And I'll show some examples. We also do work on uh, of course, on the topic of sustainable raw materials in our own products, that could be bio-based materials, could be recycled materials to make an adhesive. And we work also on packaging our own adhesives uh, in a sustainable way. The big focus for us is on the top, however, and the reason for that is that when you think about an item, just as you see here, flexible packaging, maybe a tray for, for vegetables and fruits, or a bottle, the amount of adhesive is really, really small usually. So that means if we can help recycle the much larger amount of plastic or paper in the packaging or in the shoe or in the furniture, then we have a much bigger impact than the adhesive itself. So that's why we put so much focus on that. And this is really where we work together with our customers, with brand owners, uh, in many associations really across the industry and also with recycling companies to try to understand what needs to be done and how the right solution will work. So let me give you a couple of examples here. First example is for flexible packaging. Um, what we've already done in this case is we developed um, adhesives um, to make this packaging, which usually has more than one plastic film. When, as a consumer, you don't see that, but they're made out of different layers. Here are some examples, two layers of polyethylene or two layers of polypropylene with an adhesive in between. And by the way, the printing ink is also in between. So we really worked on optimizing the adhesives. That means when you take such a packaging, let's say this walnut packaging, and you put it through recycling, then what you want is you want a colorless, transparent plastic to come out in the form of these small beads or granules. So you can use that to make a new bottle or some bag or any kind of thing, whether it's a pencil, vacuum cleaner, whatever you have. So we really work on optimizing the adhesive so that the color is, as you see here, almost white, almost transparent, and that we don't have a bad smell coming from the product. Because with existing adhesives, in many cases, you find something that has the color of the stage here. So it's brown or it smells bad or has some black particles. So this little bit of adhesive can really make a big difference on how good the output of recycling is. And that's, that's a key focus for us. Here's an example from debonding. So when you have these kind of juice pouches, or also if you buy a big pack of coffee, yeah, beans of coffee, two kilograms, this comes in a bag. And this bag has, you see it here, um, two layers of plastic, one polyester, one polyethylene layer. And in the middle, there's aluminum foil. Why is the aluminum foil there? It's there to protect the aroma. If you didn't have it, your coffee would oxidize and taste sour. Uh, your orange juice would not taste like orange anymore. So to protect the food from spoilage, uh, the design includes aluminum. And our adhesives have been used for many, many years, more than 20 years to make such packaging. And the qu question was always, how can we make the packaging as stable as possible yeah, so that uh, it will never come apart? Since uh, about a year, one and a half years, we've been working very actively on how to take it apart. Really, not during the time that you have it at home or that you still want to take your coffee out of it. But when it comes to the recycling bin and when it's being put into the recycling process, that we're able to take the different layers apart. And here what we did is we worked together with a, with a German startup uh, called Saperatec. They are a technology startup. They are building a recycling plant which will be able to take such packaging apart. And what you need 
is you need their process to do this debonding. And what you also need is an adhesive that works with the process. And that's exactly what we designed. So what you can see here on the right, these are real examples, these different types of flakes. There's aluminum in the middle and polyester and polyethylene. So what we really did together with them is um, have a large amount, uh, a couple of tons of material um, that was sent through the process, separated into three different parts. And each of these parts now um, can go to recycling, right? So you will have three different streams now uh, out of which you can make new plastics and new aluminum. And then new designs. So probably all of you know these kinds of trays for convenience food, for example, whether it's, yeah, whether it's fruits or whether it's vegetables, maybe a pre-made salad, sliced pineapple, but also, for example, sandwiches, ready meals, and so on. The way these are typically designed is they have the tray and then they have a lid on the tray. And the lid is not just one material. Again, when you look at it as a consumer, you don't see that it's two types of plastic. And these two plastics, polyester and polyethylene, are really not compatible. So you cannot do anything with the lid at all. And worse, if the lid is on the tray, you cannot do anything with the tray overall. So that means today, these are really not recycled at all. Uh, although, in principle, they would be very attractive because they're usually not printed. Um, there's a lot of polyester in there, which is valuable and can be easily recycled. The issue is how the lid is designed. And what we have done is not develop an adhesive, uh, but what we developed is a coating. So you see it on the top right. So instead of putting two plastic layers together, you just put one coating, which is also much thinner than the, the second type of plastic. You put that on the lid, and that also allows you to make the tray itself also from one material. So that means you have something that is in itself very compatible because the design is different. So it means you can leave the lid on, uh, and you can recycle the lid together with the tray, or just the lid, or just the tray. So any combination, no matter how the consumer behaves, you can recycle it. And these would be very, very high value plastics. And you can see on the bottom right, uh, what we did is we recycled just the lid. That's the worst case. We didn't even look at the tray, just the lid. And you can see a nice uh, transparent material that comes out. So that's really a way of having a new design that kind of goes around the problem. There's a couple of other examples, and I think this is now um, uh, very well known. So almost between I made the slide and that I presented here, I've really noticed more and more places offer you paper straws. So uh, in every part of the world, Asia, United States, Canada, um, Europe, when you get a straw, many, many cases, it's a paper straw. And what we did here is we make adhesives to make these straws. Now, when you make a plastic straw, you don't need adhesives, it's just plastic. Um, you cannot make a paper straw uh, that easily or at all uh, with the resistance without uh, putting it together with an adhesive. So what we did here is we really have a new design and the adhesive allows to use the bio-based material paper, which is good, and paper is also biodegradable. So that means we have something that is more sustainable from its source and also has uh, a better, uh, much better chance to degrade if it is thrown in the environment. I mean, we're definitely not recommending or encouraging that anybody throws away their straws, but if it happens, at least you have with the paper a different base material than plastic. And that's very much in line with what Europe is doing. I'm sure all of you have seen that in the press, that Europe is banning single-use plastics, which includes um, definitely the straws, but includes also single-use uh, forks and knives and all these kinds of products. And finally, um, a much bigger example in a sense. So you can take this um, to a very different scale even. So what you see here is a building, and that's a quite high building. I don't know, it's something like 12 floors. Uh, and it's made out of wood. So it's also an example of a new design um, where we took technology, which is used to make furnitures, for example, which is also used in some packaging examples. And together with wood companies, um, what we can do is make what is called engineered wood. So that means you can make very, very long beams out of wood. Uh, you can also make wooden panels and other things. And they are so strong that you can build high-rise buildings with that. 
And the key here, in this case, is not immediately recycling, uh, because uh, a building usually lasts at least 50, maybe 100 years. Uh, here, it's really most about using a renewable raw material, but it's enabled through the adhesive. And by the way, also wood is recyclable at the end. So you can grind it down into, into uh, small bits, and then you can put it back together, uh, also with adhesive again. So and this really allows for a much more sustainable way to build buildings. And there's, a couple, there's, there's many more examples, I think, but they all follow these three mechanisms. Yeah, so you have either compatibility or you have the bonding, which is opposite of why you buy an adhesive uh, until now, or you have completely new designs. So with that, uh, I'm more or less at the end. So what I hope I can leave you with is really uh, a few key things. So I think everybody sees that the world is really in motion when it comes to sustainability, and it's a great thing because it's not only about technical solutions, it's also about the timing being right, it's about the political consensus behind it and, uh, and consumers and citizens asking for those solutions. So and the time feels really right to do something about this now. Then I hope I was able to show you that we as a manufacturer of adhesives, uh, although you may not expect it, we believe we're really at the, at the center of a lot of what's going on here with uh, packaging with consumer goods. Um, and we want to be a positive change in, in that area, of course. And we believe that the world can really be more sustainable with the right adhesives and coatings. Um, and as I showed you, we feel really it's these three things. Being compatible with recycling, being able to take things apart that can't be recycled together, and go for very much more circular designs from the very beginning. So with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. All right, questions now then. Raise, raise hands, please. Anyone over there, please? So just, just to get started also, Dennis, uh, we were talking before about uh, the oceans of plastics. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have your view and how what you're doing and on circular economy mm -hmm. has or does not have an impact on uh, plastic oceans. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think that's a very important question because these are really sometimes considered as separate things. So people talk about ocean plastic pollution and people talk about circular economy. And of course, it's about plastic mainly. And we feel that there are different ways, as I briefly mentioned, to address plastic in the ocean. And one way is to improve collecting. Uh, one way is to improve the management of waste in those countries where most of the ocean plastic comes from. You can have a lot of um, options here, but the key thing is if all we do is collect the waste from the oceans or prevent it from entering, and then we burn it or we put it in landfill, then what we've done is we've lost still the value of the plastic. We've not given it a second life. So what will happen is we'll pay for it. I mean, it becomes a cost, and it becomes then a challenge to pay for something uh, which has no value. And the circular economy has the opportunity of giving the value to plastics when they have reached the end of life. So that means there will be um, really an economy around this. So it pays off to collect it, pays off to do something with it. We keep that value. And the nice example is, you can do the, uh, don't, please don't do the experiment, do it in your minds. If you drop an aluminum can, uh, if you drop a polyester bottle, and if you drop a piece of paper, and if you drop another type of plastic, and you come back a day later, I promise you, um, in Europe, definitely the aluminum can is not gonna be there anymore. It hasn't disintegrated, it was picked up, and somebody took the value, right? And in most parts of the world, also the polyester bottle. If you drop it in India, if you drop it in Brazil, it will be gone next day. People will sell, t pick it and sell it, and it will get recycled. So it's all about the value, right? So, and that will really make it happen much more on its own rather than forcing through regulation or paying for the disposal. Thank you, Dennis. Thank Please. You. Thank you, Mr. Bradman. Um, uh, regarding your speech uh, about this matter, it was very useful for us, and uh, I'm just uh, wondering, um, when it comes to nanomaterials, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if uh, your company or maybe the, the 
the industry are going to use somehow in this uh, environment? Uh, does it have any impact now or maybe later? Mm -hmm. it, did you say nanomaterials? Nanomaterials. Nanomaterials, right. So I, I didn't touch it uh, today at all. So um, I think it is, has always been a discussion uh, whether it should be used. And I think um, it really depends uh, on the case. Yeah. I think what circular economy um, and also the whole discussion today about it, pollution of the environment with, let's say, microplastics and other things teaches us is we need to understand the consequences. So if we work with nanotechnology, for example, we would, as Henkel, definitely want to understand the consequences. And it's, it's really the same kind of thinking. You have to think, if, if nanotechnology can help me be more efficient uh, or save resources when I make something, that's one thing. But we need to look at when the item will come to its end of life, what will happen then? Will the nanotechnology be out in the environment? And if so, what will happen? Right? So it will depend. So if you have things that um, are not harmful or that would degrade in the environment, then that's, of course, uh, an option to go. If it would persist in the environment, we would be very careful. So just time for one more question before coffee break. Yeah. There you go. Vielen Dank, Dennis. Um, I have uh, one question. It's about collaboration. So mm -hmm. um, I think we all agree that um, the circular economy won't happen without collaboration. You yes. mentioned that for these projects, you need designers, mm -hmm. you need engineers, you need waste managers. Right. Um, how do you achieve, how, how does Henkel achieve mm -hmm. this collaboration? Is this mm -hmm. through research and development programs? Is that through this Ellen MacArthur Foundation? Mm -hmm. Um, platform, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, thanks, that's also a very good question. Uh, yes, absolutely, collaboration is key. No one will solve it on their own, uh, that's very clear. Uh, and at the end, um, I think it depends a bit uh, on the format. We are part of El MacArthur Foundation, we're part of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. In North America, we're part of Sustainable Packaging Coalition. Uh, we are part of CFLEX here in Europe for flexible packaging. So all these are um, associations that go from Adhesives and ink producers, plastics producers, packaging manufacturers, um, brand owners, recyclers. And importantly, also the people who will use the recycled plastic. So that's a great way. Um, but then you have a, a huge group um, and you have competitors there as well. So this is really, we feel, where you can agree on a standard. Yeah? So a nice example is that I always take is when you think about a car, at some point everybody decided how high the bumper will be, right? So when you have a crash, the cars will protect you because they were designed to fit together you know, in a way that protects the passengers. And I think it's the same here. So these big forms are excellent to, to agree on how we're going to do it. Um, but then when you want to do research, when you want to come up with technical solutions, it's much more one-on-one. -on -one. So it could be one adhesive manufacturer, one brand owner, one recycler. Um, and it depends. But you need partners. That's extremely clear. And we do this all the way from very practical things, buying solutions for our own packaging, to doing really uh, frontier research. Great. Thank you very much again, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you.